Okay, everyone, so we're going to talk about scatter. Uh, and we know scatter is bad, and we know scatter messes up contrast, and we know one way to reduce scatter is to pollinate. That's probably the best way to reduce scatter. We know that we could reduce scatter a little bit by lowering the KV, but we can't always do that when we need KV. So that's not really a good option. One of the best options to reduce scatter is to use a grid. A grid, its sole purpose in life is to reduce scatter, for it does nothing else that's good. In fact, it's bad for patients because you have to increase your exposure to use them, right? And the grid is underneath the patient. So when you jack up your exposure four times, four times, um, the patient really feels that because grids are really, really good at cleaning up not only good photons, but bad photons or vice versa. In other words, they're almost too good for their own good. So to even the odds out, so we get more good that don't get killed by the grid, we actually have to increase the number of photons. That's why we got to go up four times. So they come in usually not too many different shapes, but they usually come in different sizes, like a 10 by 12 and a 14, 17. But more often than not, they come in different grid ratios, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, which really tells you how good is a particular grid at cleaning up scatter, because some are better than others. And there's a reason we'll talk about in a minute, not to just use the best one. Obviously, there's some kind of trade-off going on. So we'll talk about why not just use the best one, you might think, which would make sense. Uh, but there's a reason why there's different grid ratios. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and yeah, scatter is bad. Uh, that's all that this particular slide is showing you. Um, scatter, like we said, is going to, you know, destroy your contrast. It shows up as noise. So, uh, and you really can't fix it that well. Although they are creating new algorithms, um, that are allowing on certain studies uh, the ability to get rid of a grid that you would usually use and just use some mathematical technique that helps reduce noise from scatter. This is new. It's not going to show up on your registry for a long time, so I'm still going to talk about why we need to use grids all the time. Um, although uh, I've heard they are using such techniques over at the hospital special surgery where they use everything new. Basically, I call them. When I hear about something new, I call them first because they get new stuff. They're always doing new stuff. Okay. Um, so where's our scatter coming from? KB, but that is the least important factor for scatter. So key thing about KB. Yes, you'll get a little bit more scatter when KB is increased. But still, remember we've talked about using KB higher is a good thing? Keep going with that. The slight increase of scatter when you increase KV is not a reason not to increase KV. Now, two and three are much bigger contributors. Two is the largest one. Collimation, field size. This is a good reason to collimate because not only do you reduce the dose, but you reduce the scatter, which destroys the contrast, so always collimate as much as you can. Three, really not much you can do with the thickness of the part. You can't take 400 pound person that you're doing the KUB on and turn them into like an aesthetic 140 pound person. Not happening. There's another slide in there that talks about this in more detail where you may be able to compress the patient or the part not too often. The only thing I can really think of where that comes to play is mammography, actually, which is any women have a mammography, they know about the whole compression thing, not pleasant. I can't, I've never had one, but I've heard not very nice things about that. Other than, you know, they may save your life in the end if they find something and you take care of it. So, you know. All right, um, so like I said, KV, yes, when you increase it, it's going to give you less photoelectric effect, and that's why you get more scatter, because more comes out. 
which means you're going to have a mixture of more coming out nice and straight, but you're also going to have more coming out in, the, in that remnant beam at, at angles that you're not happy with. Right? Remember, the scatter is, I describe it as kind of misinformation or not the best data about the attenuation of the tissues, right? So if you can get rid of some of it, it gives you a better image. I mean, if you look at it the other way, all that scatter is giving misleading information, messing up the reconstruction process and showing up as noise in your image. Uh, so I would still use higher KV, right? Because it's nominal, it's on the lower end of scatter causing things compared to collimation and the patient thickness and size themselves. So I would continue to use uh, higher KV, not extremely high KV. I don't know what the percentage is exactly, right? Um, but I can tell you on a hand, if you're using 65 to 75 KV or on some extremities, you're not going to go up to 120 KV. Where does it exactly stop? I can't tell. Probably 85 is too high also. Is it? Can you get by with 76? Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, so we should continue to use our, our KV and try to keep it on the higher versus the lower side. And field size, though, we said is more important, right? Um, so we want to collimate not only to reduce dose, but also to reduce scatter. And remember, if you like arrows, scatter down, contrast off. Right? So whenever scatter goes down, it's a good thing for contrast. And look at this. I, I underlined it. Collimation is the primary mechanism for controlling scatter. That means you should, but here's, here's the thing. Okay. Uh, and by the way, this slide just talks about patient thickness and, and possibly maybe using a compression pat up. Um, paddle, which we hardly ever use, maybe in uh, GI work sometimes to move the small bowel around, um, that kind of thing. But not much you can do about patient size. So the two biggest contributors to scatter are what? The patient and the collimation, the field size. So now, this is a lose-lose-lose a when you think about it. So what happens to technologists? Patient is really big, so one, they need to use more KV. That's a negative, but they have to. That's gonna to attribute to scatter a little bit. Number two, patient is bigger, means more atoms, more molecules, more stuff, more interactions, more scatter. That's lose number two. Lose number three, patient is bigger, so people collimate less. They're afraid to collimate, they don't want to miss anything. So they open their collimation, their field size more, and then you get more scatter. That's a lose, lose, lose if you're big in our field. Such is life. The only exception, the only reason I'm not flipping the slide right away is one particular big portion of the body being the chest is actually full of air in your lungs, so you can't go by the thickness of your chest and compare it to the thickness of your abdomen, even if they happen to be about the same from A to P, anterior posterior. Because one is full of muscle and fat and snow if you're out there. Um, but it's not what you can do when patient is large, except use a grip. That you can do. And try to collimate as much as you can. And use more KV, but not, not crazy amounts of KV. Although sometimes you might have to max out the KV. So there are a few slides coming up related to what the grid is and its history and how it works. And they are somewhat interchangeable. So I'll just kind of give you the brief definition or explanation of what a grid is and how it works. And then we'll go through the slides. So, grid is a device, a physical device, made up of lots of very, very thin strips of either lead or aluminum. More lead than aluminum. 
They're spaced out, so they have a space in between them. Remember, photons are really small. So the photons that go straight through and don't hit one of these lead lines, they make it to the image receptor. But the little lead lines will absorb the photons that come in the remnant beam at an angle, right? So they come out of you, they're coming at an angle, they're representing scatter, Compton scatter, they will get annihilated, removed, before they interact with the image receptor by these lead lines. Problem, like I said, is, you know, you might have a slight angle that has mostly good information in it, and it gets killed also, right? So we have to end up increasing our exposure to have like lots of good photons so that even if some of the good ones die, we still have plenty with which to use for reconstruction. We still collect enough data. So that's why you have to increase your exposure because not only do you kill the scatter, but you also get rid of some of the good photons, right? If a photon is off by a couple of degrees, it's still pretty much good. And some grids have these closer together and some grids have them further together, right? The ones that are further away, uh, more get through. So you don't need as high of an exposure. The ones that are closer together, you need more exposure because more get killed. But the ones that are closer together will provide the highest contrast because they will reduce scatter the most. They kill the most photons. You can look at it that way. The rest of our talk is how to use the grid properly and a few other little things about grids. But that's pretty much the gist already. So they're made of little lead lines. They're super thin, five thousandths of an inch, if you like metrics. 0.1, so like a tenth of a millimeter. That's tiny, like a millimeter, trying to draw like 10 lines with a little space in between. That's tiny, which is why grids are very expensive to manufacture. Uh, and please don't drop our grids, even though they test them a little bit. Um, they can break and they're super expensive. Not like thousands of dollars, but hundreds of dollars. And we don't want to spend neither of those. So. This radiation that's coming in at an angle, you see it getting destroyed. So only the good ones that have the most important information about the attenuation of the tissues that it's gone through that will end up into your grayscales make it through, right? We're good so far, right? Okay. So grids go back a ways. Um, what'd you say, 18 years? 18 years after the discovery of x-rays and we're already like, you know, improving our contrast by creating grids. This grid is a little crazy though. This grid up here is a cross hatch grid. So the lines go in both directions and you create these little squares like graph paper. These are very rare to find anymore because they're very difficult to use because any angle that you place on the tube at all is directing your photons into a line that's crisscrossed. So a crosshatch grid can only be used with a perpendicular beam, right? And then your alignment has to be perfect also because the beam is diverging anyway. So this grid, hardly ever used. But what's important in this slide is modern grids are getting rid of attenuating, meaning absorbing, 80 to 90% of the scatter, but leaving all the sharpness and the details and all the good stuff. So they work wildly well overall. It's kind of worth dosing the patient. I hate to say it that way, but we, we wouldn't use them if they didn't work. And it's not just like, you know, two steps back and one step forward, we're, we're getting like much better images, right? We had a lab like this and I should have did the lab a little bit differently. For, for some of you, 
uh, we just started with like a lower KV and then a higher KV, mm -hmm. right? What we really should have started with, uh, and I did in one of my labs, so maybe some of you were in it. We started with like, instead of image one, we started with image zero and we took a baseline image of like the pelvis or whatever it was um, with the actual grid. And then we switched to tabletop. And there's a huge difference, right, between using a grid and, and not. So where are these grids? We'll get to grid ratio in a second. The grids are built into the buckets. Okay, so when you open up a bucket, you don't see the grid though. So you might be like, what is he talking about? You see this like tray where you put your cassette in. You actually, you know, because I showed you, but I don't know how many people I showed. You actually have to get on your knees with the tray open and look, and you can see this kind of silver band that's about a centimeter thick go across and it kind of extends into the table. That's your grid. So there is this 14 by 17 or maybe 17 by 17 actual grid built into the buckies, both upright and table. And grids come in two major varieties. There is a stationary grid and a reciprocating grid. So stationary grids are the grids that you take under your arm. You might have seen them in the corner where we have the old film. Uh, and there are these white kind of like molded plastic things where you slip your CR cassette and then you take it on a portable with you and just put it underneath the patient somewhere. The reciprocating grids are the ones that you use. They're the ones built into the buckies. And the reason why we call them reciprocating is because when you press the prep button, besides what we've talked about in the past where the rotor starts to spin, and your, your anode starts to spin and your MA kind of gets applied and your filament heats up. If you're using the table bucky, which is one of the things on the console that you have to press to indicate that you're using it, that's why it's there. While you're hitting that prep button, the bucky starts to vibrate a little bit. And that vibration helps the image by blurring the little lines together so you don't see them. Because there is a problem with stationary grids, especially. Sometimes you actually see the faint grid lines, mm -hmm. and they're distracting on, on, uh, to whoever's looking at the radiograph. Now, that, to a certain extent, is also going away because, we'll talk about this in a minute, the grid frequency, how many grid lines do you have per inch, has increased tremendously. So just the fact that they're so close together has made them blur and not obscure the image. And they're not, so grid lines is really a problem of the past for the most part. I have tried in the lab to create grid lines by doing things incorrectly. And it's really hard to do. So got to go with the image in the book. So grid ratio is by far, out of all the things we will talk about, and there's only one or two more things, the, the biggest contributing factor that makes one grid better than another grid. So before we get into it, the higher the grid factor, the more scatter is cleaned up. Okay, so uh, the higher the grid ratio, the more scatter cleanup. The lower the grid ratio, less scatter cleanup. But remember I told you some grids, the spacing is different between the lines. The closer the lines are together, the higher the grid ratio. That's why it cleans up more scatter, because it kills more photons because there's less room for the photons to get by. I always think of the poor little photons getting, smacking into a lead line, just dying. Where do they go after that? I don't know, they go to photon limbo. So one of the calculations that you will need to know is how to figure out the grid ratio. Because if I gave you two different sets of numbers, 
And I told you, you have to figure out the grid ratio because you have to tell me which grid is better or not as good at cleaning up scatter. You should be able to figure that out. So the grid ratio is simply one little division problem. Of course, you got to make sure you have the numerator and the denominator correct. But you have to, so it's defined as the relationship between the height, the H, compared to the width which to me is the bigger factor, uh, between the interspace material. So the grid ratio is H over D. So in this particular example, you'll have a grid, let's say it's three uh, millimeters uh, thick, or that's your height, so that's the H, the D is more clear. It has a space between the lead strips, right? So if you had to guess which one is which, you got to go with between the lead strips. It has to be the 0.5. You guys see? And then when you do the math, you get 6. 6 what? Don't ask me why. You always have to put 6 colon 1, which stands for 6 to 1. They're all the same kind of problem, right? Another problem, you'll get an answer that's 8 to 1. Another one will be 12 to 1. Another one might be 16 to 1. It's always something to 1. It's always something to 1. And the higher the number is always going to be the highest, the highest grid ratio cleans up the most scatter, but technically requires the most exposure. That's the trade off. So the, the higher, the, higher the, the grid ratio, right. right, gives you the highest, the highest contrast, it kills the most scatter, but it requires the most exposure. Think about it this way, it kills the most scatter. Remember I told you it's going to kill go both good and bad. So you can say that the highest grid ratio grid will also clean up a lot of the good photons, which is why you have to give it more. Right. So you guys will thank me later, right? Because technically, depending on the grid ratio, you should increase slightly more, right? Going from lower grid ratio to higher grid ratio requires more and more exposure. But we're just going to give you one multiplication, right? We're just going to say whatever grid you go to from no grid, you multiply your mass by four. You go up four times versus 3.5 times, 3.8 times, 3.9 times. And we just kind of average it and say four. There was a time where I made everyone memorize everything. Yes. Is there like an optimal grid that you use? So that's a good question. Is there an optimum grid? So the reason why there are different grid ratios and you just don't go with the highest is not because the highest costs more money, which it does, right? But think about it this way. Uh, when, the, when the lines are closer together, you have less uh, ability to angle your tube in different ways. So if you're doing a complicated study, let's say it's a portable exam, patients sitting uh, in the chair at some weird angle, so they're not supine and they're not standing up nice and straight, which means you have to angle your tube and all this stuff. That means you may accidentally, and this is the big risk, you accidentally send more of your photons actually into the lines. That's less likely to happen with a lower grid ratio because you have more spacing. It might not seem like more spacing, but for tiny little photons, it's a lot more space. If you're not worried about those variables and you have nice, you know, parallel structures and perpendicular beams and your alignment is perfect, right? And your center ray is going through and hitting the, the center of the image, then you can get away with like a 16 to one, which is, I think is like the highest grid ratio. There might be some specialized ones out there. But a lot of, of us starting um, tables or machines, a lot of the grids are already built into the. Um, yeah, so that, so you know? so those so that's a good question. So it's kind of like let me rephrase that. So you you come to the table bucky and it just has a particular grid ratio in it. So how do you know if it's good or not? Um, those grids are usually like middle of the ground, right? They're usually kind of not at the very low end, um, but closer to the lower end than the higher end to allow you a little bit of variability. 
Um, there are some spaces, specialized. I'm not so big, and the spaces are not so small. Right. So they're kind of like in the middle, right? And and they'll work for just about all the exams that that you do in that kind of room. If you have a very specific room, right? Um, then you may have a built-in grid um, that uh, is made for the particular exam that's common to that room. So there used to be uh, a room that was dedicated to skull work, right? And they used to have these equipment called like a Franklin head unit. It would have a, a grid that matched up well to a, to a head. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I mentioned it in the last class. I wasn't sure what I remember it. <laughs> A lot of the facilities you go to will actually swap out the grids. They have like a little rack with different grids. You pop the one that's out there and put it in, and they're color coded and everything. We don't do that here. Whatever's in there is in there, right? Um, so you will know this when you get into the hospitals, and they will tell you, you know, for a chest, you take out this grid and put in the orange one or whatever color it might be. Uh, so we're good on grid ratio. So we know that higher grid ratio gives you more scatter cleanup, leading to better contrast. But the penalty is higher dose, right? The other penalty is less latitude in terms of your uh, positioning and your alignment and all that stuff, right? So you know if you have a cut and dry case, um, you can go at a higher grid ratio. But when you're doing portables or you're doing trauma work and you're doing, I don't know, cross table APs on the stretcher and all sorts of weird stuff, then you have a problem. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this kind of theme of difficulty level, because one of the other things related to grids is besides coming in different grid ratios, um, they also come in different focal ranges where you have to use the grid uh, within a certain uh, you have to you have to determine your choice of grid based on your SID. But we'll get to that in a second. So grid frequency, not as important as grid ratio, but it tells you how many lines there are per inch. And uh, the more grid lines you have per inch, the less chance of actually seeing grid lines on the image. And like I mentioned, grid lines can be distracting, especially to a radiologist. So uh, here's an example of a couple of grids. Well, well, we'll get into this example in the red box in a second, but just take a look here. We've gone from, uh, let's just use the, the two We've gone from 60 to 120 lines, up as high as 200 lines per inch. 200 tiny little lines. I mean, what machines do you use to make that? If I were to be able to go on an x-ray field trip, I've always thought about this. My x-ray field trip would be like to the place where they make the grids. It might end up being more boring than my imagination is, but there's a reason why these things cost so much money, right? It's very precision, you know, uh, really, really hard. And, and, you know, it's not just, it's just not, the grid is not just one inch, right? The grid is a whole big thing. It's like, so, I don't know. I've watched some YouTube videos, but nothing is really, nothing out there it has really gotten my attention just yet. So here are a couple grids. We have grid B has a higher grid ratio than grid A. It's a 3.3 versus a 2.5. So what does that mean? That means that the interspace is thinner. You see the difference? But what it also means is anything over 18 degrees, uh, I think, dies. Right here, we have a little bit more room for for angled or or I should say beams that are diverging. So the top grid is going to be a little bit easier to use. Right, it allows you a little bit more latitude in your angle. 
In general, you should always angle parallel to the lines. So if the lines are running across in front of me, I need to angle like we do, right? Either cephalically or caudally. How often do we angle like towards the wall or towards yourself? Not too common, but what you can do, especially with a stationary grid, is if you put the stationary grid crosswise instead of lengthwise, then you've put lines directly in the way of the beam. Then you get bad, bad images. The last few images are just examples of what's called the general term for bad image caused by incorrect use of grid is known as grid cutoff. So if you hear, if you hear someone say, I got grid cutoff, you know that's bad. And this stuff is, for the most part, unfixable by digital imaging. Now, when these algorithms come in and they start working for everything, then maybe we get rid of grids entirely and they're just really good mathematically somehow at getting rid of the noise caused by scatter. And when that happens, I will teach it and then we'll change things. But for now, uh, I don't see that happening on a large basis. Uh, and I should mention, there's always a grid no matter what procedure you're doing in DR, it's built in. That's the same question you had before. I don't know what the grid ratio, I've always thought about that. Um, Maybe it's like when they- I mean, I guess you can change the grids, but they're they're pretty variable. I mean, allowing you to do a lot of different exams. Wouldn't the manufacturer give you that idea? What type of grid is oh yeah, you could look it up somewhere. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's not a complete mystery, but I, I can't tell you right now, I guess I'd have to look for it, what the grid ratio is that's built into the first DR room, or room two for that matter, right next to it. It's in there though. Uh, so I don't have to spend much time here, right? This is just talking about why, why we use grids, which I already kind of outlined in our, our intro, it's because they increase contrast, right? Uh, I think. That's enough to say, right? Just remember, you know, it comes at the price of dose, a lot of dose, right? If you're doing um, AP, lateral, both oblique, lumbar spine, so four images, that means each one of those is four times the amount of radiation that you would normally use in general, right? So that's 16 times the radiation in that one exam. So when do we use a grid? Well, it's weird. In DR, we're kind of using it all the time. But the general rule for using a grid is based on the thickness of the patient. And the, the magic number for test purposes is 13 centimeters. For me, in reality, I use, when it comes to extremities, to me it's a knee, in my mind. It's whether the knee is like, a big knee or an average to small knee. Because at that point, sometimes I'll use the grid if I think the knee is like really big. And then for most average people, I don't use a grid on a knee. Right. Uh, everything else is pretty much clear cut, right? All the other extremities for the most part is, is no grid. We used to call that tabletop technique. Although there is no tabletop really in, in DR. Uh, right, only in the regular rooms where you're using the Bucky is there the difference between the tabletop, where you have the CR cassette on top of the table, um, or Bucky work, where you have it inside the Bucky. When we use a CR cassette in the DR room, that's not the way you're supposed to really use it. We do it anyway, right? For a lot of our experiments, it's okay. But normally in a DR room, you use DR. That's what it's there for. Um, so, and they're saying here that around an eight to one grid ratio is good for a 13 centimeter part. Uh, as you might expect, the thicker the part, the higher the grid ratio you want to use, uh, unless you're worried about your angles and your SID. So when you're doing trauma work, where you're not sure what your SID is going to be, or you're doing 
a portable study where a patient is in, you know, not going to be aligned as well as if they were on a table, you know, down in the department. In general, there's a lot of reasons why doing the study portably is not good. And one of those reasons, among many, are using a grid is more difficult. So your contrast may suffer in a portable exam because you don't want to use the highest grid ratio. Because you run the risk of repeating. Again, at the end, you'll see what can happen with grid cutoff. So field size, though, this is the biggest contributor to scatter. This is where we really want to, you know, control things as much as we can. So when do you use a grid besides thickness, right? So the questions you want to ask are first thickness. Then, you know, am I going to be using a, a very big field size? Because if I'm going to have collimation that's all the way open, that's going to generate a lot of scatter. I probably should use a grid. You almost don't have to think about that because most of the time uh, you're going to use a grid on a big object which requires a large field size. So they it kind of like, there's not a whole lot of thought that has to go into this in most cases. The only other thought as to should I use a grid is will the KB be extremely high? So in chest radiography, in the department where the patient can stand, we're usually at what is it, 110, 120 KB. Um, that's why we do our, our studies with a grid. But we do our portable chest x-rays with less KB without a grid. So in the department, same patient, you use 120. If that patient becomes a portable, and that actually happens a lot of times, um, then you're not using 120 anymore, you're down to 80 or 85, but without a grid. And of course, appropriate mass. So I thought like the chest x-rays don't really require a grid. They come out better with a grid. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is no department that I've ever gone to or heard of that does not use a grid on chest x-rays for a patient that can stand <clears throat> against the bucket. At the same time, I hardly ever, ever see anyone using a grid for a portable chest x-ray because there's too many variables, both SID and angle of the patient and all of that. Portable abdomens, they use grids on them. So portable KUB, if the patient is sitting up, you lay them down, right? Because KUBs are supposed to be done supine. So when you do something supine, you can more easily have a perpendicular beam. You're not angling all over the place. So we bring that stationary grid, the slip-on grid that I mentioned, um, with us. Got to find it. That might be an issue sometimes. And do you think you're going to have a real variety of grid ratios? Probably not. You're lucky to find the grid. Uh, but that's the one that you actually take with you. And you would use that for... Uh, things that are supine. So you could use it on a hip. You could use it on a, a spine, right? Um, but anything that becomes an angle, you wouldn't use it on a foot, not if you're gonna angle 15 degrees. I mean, you could, but you wouldn't use it on a foot anyway. So these two terms are really just more technical than anything. Uh, the Bucky factor is a way to distinguish or think about the mass or the exposure with a grid compared to not having a grid. Basically, the multiplication by four is what Bucky factor is. But it gets more complicated. There is a formula that you can use for Bucky factor that you don't need to know. I no longer teach it. If you're interested, you could look at Bouchon. But um, there's a formula that you could do that will tell you how to adjust your mass if you're going from like an 8 to 1 to a 16 to 1. And technically, it's more accurate. The other way to kind of think about how good a grid is or the efficiency of the grid uh, is known as grid selectivity, right? Which is defined as, you know, the difference or the ratio between the primary radiation that's transmitted through the grid uh, to the scattered radiation going through the grid. This one is 
less utilized than the bunky factor. So this is really just a definitional term that you're not going to use much in practice. Bunky factor, like I mentioned, technically, you know, there's this formula you could use that actually changes your exposure based on the grid ratio. That's meaningful. So like I've said a couple of times now, and all in red, all we have to do is multiply by four. Or if you're going from grid to non-grid, you quarter whatever the exposure was. Right? And go both ways. Um, and yeah, it's not perfect, right? You have different manufacturers. You can't assume that, that the thickness of the lead is going to be the same no matter what grid manufacturer you're using. And we don't know if any particular department bought all the same grids. And we're going to finish in just a minute because this is the recording that's going up. It's better than the last class. Um, ah, not much. Not like they didn't learn anything. Um, so yeah, it, it's a technique that's tough and you don't want to go outside anyway, right? Um, <clears throat> but grids, grids work really well. You just have to make sure that you're aligned properly to them and within the correct focal range. But here's what I'm talking about. Let's look at the right side first. Here you have three different grids and there's a lot more than these three grid ratios. But notice the differences between them and what you would change your mass. Okay, so the first one to the second one, that's a big difference, right? But going from one grid to another grid, three and a half, three and three quarters, four, they're all about the same. So the essence is if you're going from no grid to any grid ratio, multiply by four versus multiply by three and a half or multiply by three and three quarters. I'm sparing you this. I do want you to understand, though, that technically – the higher the grid ratio, the higher the exposure should be. And technically, you should feel bad if you multiply by four when you could have multiplied by three and a half, and you're going to give that person a little bit more radiation. So in the hospital, you should think more appropriately, but for the purposes of the test, it's multiply by four or use a quarter if you're going the opposite direction from grid to non-grid. Right? We're all clear? I feel guilty talking about this. It's like I want to give you math. Look at the other side. Grid ratios, 8 to 1, 10 to 1, 12 to 1, even when you change your KB from 70 to 95, they're still around 4. 3.5, 4.3, 4.3, 3.8. It's still basically, regardless of KB and regardless of grid ratio, you're multiplying by 4. So we're almost done. Grid cutoff. We said grid cutoff is essentially anything bad uh, that shows up on an image where a grid was used. So things like grid lines, that's grid cutoff. Uneven densities, ununiform density, that's grid cutoff. If your alignment is off, if the reciprocation mechanism is broken in the bucky and it vibrates weird, um, that can cause grid cutoff and grid lines. So if your alignment is off, remember that's all, we did a, a lab thing like this where even if you're not angling, just by being far off from the central ray, it's like angling. So you can get images where your image is not going to look so good. Here's a couple other examples. Uh, okay, before we get to another example, this is important. Uh, grids are usually known as focused grids, right? And they're meant... Their lead lines aren't all parallel. They're more parallel in the center. So let me show you this image. At first, you thought this was the entire grid, right, where all the lines are parallel to each other. The reality is most of the time they are known as focus grids, and the grid lines are not parallel. They're kind of at angles, and they're designed to match up with the divergence of the beam. So they are more parallel in the middle because that's where you have the least amount of divergence. Make sense? So now here's the other reason why SID means something. The grids, I told you, come in different focal ranges because depending on what SID you're using, 
you have to use the correct, correct focused grid. So usually there's two grids, two different focus grids. One that works between 36 and 42 inches SID, and another one that works best if you're using a range of 66 to 74 inches. Because if you use the incorrect grid based on the SID you're using, you can also get grid cutoff, right? Because the lines will no longer match with the divergence because the divergence changes with the SID. So here's an example if you're off with your SID, right? You can't fix that, right? This one was used with 20 inches SID. Now, how often is that gonna happen? Probably not too often. You shouldn't be at 20 inches anyway. Here's another incorrect thing. If you use it upside down, all of a sudden the, the, you're killing basically all of the photons. And the only ones that make it through were the ones in the middle where you had the ones that were going straight to begin with. Actually, I don't like how they drew this. Imagine this one that actually looks like if you flipped it upside down, the ones in the middle would still go through. So they, they need to fix that picture a little bit, right? But even if even this straight line represents only the photons that made it through the middle, everything else gets destroyed and it's a repeat. It can't be fixed. So try not to use it upside down. As, as they try to make them so that you can't slip it in the wrong way, but people are creative and somehow do things incorrectly. And so what if, what if you take an image of, let's just say like the lower leg where you would, you would want to uh, increase the SID, say even higher than 42, because you want to be able to capture the whole body. Well, then you might need to switch the grid. You have to switch the grid. Yeah. Or if it's something you can't do, switch the room. Yeah. 